All right. Welcome everyone to the Defining Renewable Energy panel, how polluters and Wall Street are trying to hijack the renewable energy movement. Quite a mouthful for me. <laughs> um, we are just going to st get, get started and dive in. We're going to hear all about renewable portfolio standards. Once again, my name is Rebecca Wolf with Food and Water Watch and Food and Water Action. And we have a really fantastic lineup of speakers with us, us tonight, who I'll introduce in just a moment. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we would also like to thank our allies and partners who have shared this webinar with their networks, especially the pro progressive Democrats and people demanding action. And a special thank you to our speakers and their organizations as well, the Chesapeake Physicians for Res uh, Social Responsibility and NC Warren. Before we get started, I'm gonna give just a quick orientation if you're new to using Zoom. Um, this is a good time to mention that if you aren't joining us on screen share, once again, we highly recommend that you do that. And you can do that by clicking, um, clicking that link in your email. We're here on video and we'll be, we'll be sharing some slides throughout the webinar as well. We'll be keeping everyone on mute just to cut down on some background noise, but we will be taking questions throughout the presentations. If you have a question at any point in the presentation, you can click the Q&A. Again, that's Q&A. There are a couple buttons down there, but we're, we're using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to as many of those as we can throughout and at the end of the webinar. I will also note, again, that we're not using that raise hand button, so that Q&A button is where you're going to be able to get your questions in. So again, Q&A. If you have any technical issues or you're joining us over the phone and have questions, you can actually email us at help at fwaction.org. We have someone looking at those. That is help at fwaction.org. So with that, I'm gonna dive into our program. I think I can confidently say that everyone on this call knows that scientists are telling us that we need to rapidly transition to renewable energy if we want to avoid some of the worst impacts of climate change big oil companies, um, utilities, factory farms, and even some nonprofits and environmental organizations have come to together to support some pretty backwards ideas about what the definition of renewable energy is. And the greenwashing of dirty energy is a definite and real threat to our clean energy future. So we've brought together some experts for you tonight who have taken a deeper look at these policies to share these concerns directly with you. These concerns range from increasing pollution and historically overburdened communities and incentivizing waste burning to also letting utilities off use offsets to meet renewable generation goals when they burn more fossil fuels than are, than are actually allowed. So perhaps most concerning in these policies is that they're not actually effective at addressing the climate crisis and there are real distractions from some common sense policies like Tulsi Gabbard's Off Act that will end the use of fossil, fossil fuels and transition the United States to 100% renewable energy by 2035. So I'm gonna kick some things off with some introductions and then I'm gonna pass it to our panelists for tonight. First, we have Mitch Jones. Mitch is a senior policy advocate at Food and Water Watch and he represents the organization in Congress and in Maryland on a range of issues, including fracking, water infrastructure and agricultural policy. Prior to joining Food and Water Watch, he worked at the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union, focusing on issues related to food safety and renewable fuel policy. He has appeared on uh, CNBC, Al Jazeera English, and has been quoted in the Financial Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Baltimore Sun. Next, we have Tim Whitehouse. Tim has more than 20 years of experience working on a wide range of environmental issues with governments businesses, nonprofit organizations, and community groups. He has worked as an environmental consultant for companies on international trade and environmental issues, and he helped start a local nonprofit organization focusing on clean energy issues. Previously, he was the head of the law and policy program at the Commission for the Environmental Cooperation in Montreal, and a senior attorney at the US EPA in Washington, DC. He's interested in the interface of policy and science in strengthening transparency in government. We also have Connie Leeper, who is the co-convener of the NC Climate Justice Summit and the organizing director at NC Warren. As a community organizer and justice champion for the past 45 years, she has firsthand experience and knowledge of how certain people and places have been discounted in value and relevance to make change happen. 
Connie joined the climate justice movement and helped bring the NC Climate Justice Summit vision into reality um, because she knows that it's going to take all of us to create a broader movement in justice. And then last but not least, we have a video from our very own Frida. Frida is a Brussels-based Food and Water Europe campaign officer promoting a ban on fracking and a phase out of fossil gas in Europe. Working with local European groups and US-based researchers, she raises awareness of the countless risks of fracturing or fracking as we know it. After completing her master's thesis on intensive agriculture in southern Spain, Frida became involved with issues concerning the European food system as well as the transition to a sustainable energy system. I've only just summarized some of the very incredible work that all of our speakers have done and why you can, you know, trust what they're talking about and, and the experience that, that they have. I'm really excited that they're all with us here tonight and I want to thank them for being here. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it to Mitch, but just one note that we do have one of our panelists who's having some technical difficulties from NC Warren, and so we're going to um, we're going to pop her in wherever she can she can join us. Um, so thank you for your flexibility with that. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Mitch. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. I really appreciate everybody uh, getting on here tonight to talk about this really vital issue when we're considering how we're going to move forward to fight climate change. Um, you know, the adoption of renewable portfolio standards or RPSs, and that's what we're going to call them for the rest of the night is RPS, has been uh, one of the most effective public policies that states have enacted in order to promote renewable energy. The basic premise of mandatory renewable portfolio standards, and I, I emphasize mandatory because there are states that have voluntary ones, is um, basically that there's a requirement that utilities in a state sell a certain amount of quote unquote renewable electricity. There are some issues here and we're gonna get into those tonight. But before we, we mention that, I should point out that since 2000, so for the past 18 years, roughly 60% of renewable electricity growth has been due to RPS programs. It is an effective program. In fact, it's probably the most effective program. However, Current RPS programs, the current policies in place across our country, will only get the United States to 40% renewables by 2050. Let me restate that. The most effective policy we have right now for renewables will only get us to 40% by 2050. We know that's not good enough. And not only is 40%, even if it was all solar and wind, not good enough, but most states, in fact, all states, allow things other than solar and wind to count as renewables. They, they allow burning municipal trash. They allow burning uh, animal manure. They allow burning toxic waste products from various industries. These aren't clean, renewable sources of electricity generation and they undermine the effectiveness of RPS programs. And this is one of the issues that we're gonna to address tonight. In fact, wind and solar electricity generation within the electricity sector, so just focusing right now on the electricity that we're all using right now to look at our computers and have our lights on. Last year, 2017, just under 8% of our national electricity was generated from wind and solar, 8%. You'll see headlines, renewables, 20%, 8%. It was actually 7.94% was generated in the electricity sector from wind and solar. We must do better. So RPS programs have a lot of promise to actually reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But in order to do so, we're gonna to have to strengthen these programs. We're gonna to have to make these programs much better than they currently are. 
Just as a little bit of a background, the first RPS program was actually passed in Iowa in 1983. That program required 105 megawatts of wind generated electricity be, to be sold within the state. It took 14 years before any other state passed an RPS. In 1997, Massachusetts and Nevada had RPS programs come into to effect. By uh, 2017, there were 30 states plus the District of Columbia that have mandatory RPS programs. Interestingly, the year before there were 31 states, but Kansas, under pressure from the Koch brothers, made their mandatory program voluntary. Now, most states allow their uh, utilities to meet this mandate, whatever it is, 20% renewables, 10% renewables, 50% renewables, 100% renewables in the case of Hawaii by 2045. They allow their utilities to meet this requirement two different ways. They can purchase electricity generated from these renewable sources, or they can purchase pieces of paper, renewable energy credits, which allow them to claim that they're generating renewable electricity when in point of fact they're not. If the renewable energy credit or REC comes along with the electricity, we call that bundled. It means you buy the electricity, you get the piece of paper. So the wind is coming in, you get the paper, you get a call, call that wind. It, and it actually is. But we can have systems, and we do have systems, in fact, all the systems, allow for uh, these uh, racks to be unbundled from the electricity. So the electricity goes to somebody else and you buy the piece of paper and by some form of magic, the coal that the utility is actually burning or the natural gas, the fracked natural gas that the utility is actually burning becomes renewable. And Tim Whitehouse, who is, is here tonight from Chesapeake Physicians for Responsibility, uh, Social Responsibility, sorry. I'm sure they want all responsibility, but also social responsibility is their main focus, is going to talk more about that this evening. Um, so I mentioned earlier that these uh, RPS programs have a broad understanding of what renewable energy is. And I, I think Tim's going to touch on that a little bit. And if our folks from NC Warren, who unfortunately were suffering um, from, I believe, some storms tonight that knocked out power, uh, are able to get on. I know they're going to talk about it as well. We have these strange uh, sources of power being included in the RPS. Trash, trash incineration is considered renewable in at least a third of the RPS programs currently in operation in the United States. So they take your trash, they take it downtown, they stick it in an incinerator, they burn it, they use that to fire electric generation, and they call that renewable. But this process creates toxic air emissions that pollute the local community. And, you know, let's be honest, that local community tends to be lower income and tends to be predominantly people of color. This is an environmental justice issue. And they also emit greenhouse gases. Here in Maryland, one of the major sources of uh, dirty energy in our renewables is something called black liquor. Now black liquor is a toxic byproduct of the process of making paper. And in Maryland and in, again, roughly a third of the states that have RPS programs, paper mills can take this toxic product burn it, generate electricity, and sell those wrecks to a local utility so the utility can claim that the coal or the natural gas that they're actually using is renewable. An increasing source of these, what we call dirty renewables, is um, from industrial agriculture, whether it's uh, manure 
incineration, litter incineration, or digesters. It takes the waste, literally the waste, of the uh, animals in concentrated feeding, uh, animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. It takes it, it either digests it and produces methane, or it actually tosses it into an incinerator and burns it and generates electricity. And we're told that this is renewable. We know that agriculture is a major source of greenhouse gas pollution in this country and around the world. But taking the litter and manure from these animals and producing electricity from it is not renewable. It's not a solution to the problem that we're facing in industrial agriculture today. You know, these aren't the only sources of uh, dirty energy that have been included in RPSs. It can be the case that burning tires, car tires, can be included as renewable energy. And before West Virginia repealed its RPS a couple of years ago, they included coal and natural gas technologies in their list of renewable energy. We have a, a, a real problem with the definition of what is renewable in these RPS programs. And if we want these programs to fulfill their real promise and get us well beyond 40% by 2050, we have to change those definitions. And it, I, I see now, you all can't see it, but I can see it that NC Warren's been able to join us and they're gonna talk more about that issue later. So, so renewable portfolio standards have an opportunity to really deliver what we need in order to achieve our goals of fighting back against climate change. But the only way we're gonna do it is by making the goals aggressive, the energy clean, and forcing our utilities to actually produce the electricity that we need in order to fight back against climate change, not only in that sector, but in the transportation sector and across all of our economy. And with that, I know I've used up all my time. And so I'm gonna to toss it back to Rebecca. Yeah, thanks so much, Mitch. Um, if we have Connie on right now, ready to rock, maybe we should start there just as we have internet. Um, Connie, can you connect? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> While we're waiting, um, just wanted to give folks a reminder that we'll be e emailing out this recording as well as any additional resources that we cover. So if you have any questions for Mitch, just be sure to pop them in the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and we're actually going to toss it to Tim and give Connie a minute to get ready. Um, that's all good. All right, go ahead, Tim. Thanks. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. And if you right. want to do your. I'm going to okay. pull this up and uh, get it ready. Perfect. Awesome. All Tim, right. right. Great. So thank you very much. Um, for inviting me here. Uh, I've worked with Food and Water Watch for a number of years on the Renewable Portfolio Standard in Maryland and have come to understand how RECs and the Renewable Portfolio Standard have been designed to greenwash Maryland's electricity. So there are two alternate realities in the world of renewable energy in Maryland. The first reality is the fuel used to generate electricity. Yep. Bought by the so I can hear it if you can hear it. Yeah. Can you hear it? You're all set. Okay, so um, the second is the fuel used to generate the renewable energy or RECs as Mitch described in Maryland. These are two very different things. So in this presentation, I'll explain how the use of unbundled RECs or paper credits makes Maryland's grid look greener than it is and why that matters. So where does Maryland's uh, electricity come from? You'll see here that most electricity in Maryland comes from nuclear coal and natural gas with about 7% coming from hydro, wind, and utility-scale solar. This is energy generated in Maryland. Uh, Maryland's part of a regional grid called the PJM, and this is a snapshot of the energy being used on that grid 
Uh, on May 7th, Maryland gets about half its energy or just under half from this grid. So again, we see nuclear coal and gas is dominating this grid with a small amount of wind and solar. So we have to do a lot more in Maryland in the region if we have any hope of mitigating climate change. And of course, the RPS is, as Mitch said, are the main tools to do this. And unfortunately, in Maryland, we're finding that it's not, a, uh, although the best tool, it's not a very productive tool and it needs major changes. So um, as Mitch mentions, utilities must meet in Maryland RPS requirements by purchasing these renewable energy credits. And in Maryland, they have a 25% requirement by 2020. 25% must come from renewable. 2.5% of that must come from in-state solar, and up to 2% around there must come from offshore wind. Um, so the problem again here is how the system of RECs, renewable energy credits, are set up in Maryland. So this is what the REC system looks like now. So this graph shows the RECs used by fuel type in Maryland between 2006 and 2016. So your first reaction to this graph may be, that's great, things are going up. Maryland is using more and more renewable energy, and that's thanks to the RPS. But remember a couple of things. These are largely credits that are being bought and used, not the amount of energy purchased. Let's look more closely at this graph. You'll see hydropower has gone up. Uh, you'll see that black liquor, that toxic byproduct used in the pulp and paper industry is being used and those amounts are going up. You'll see wind is going up. That may be good, but I'll explain why it actually isn't good. And incineration, which is municipal solid waste, is going up. You'll see wood waste biomass has gone up uh, as a fuel source. Uh, landfill gas has gone up and down, but up overall. And solar still remains a very, very small part of Maryland's renewable portfolio standard. So what lessons can we draw from this graph and from our experience in Maryland? So the lessons we can learn, the reality is most of the new energy in Maryland's renewable portfolio standard is not new renewable energy. I'll explain that a bit more in a minute. Much of it is not clean and will not help us address climate change. And very importantly, it costs Maryland ratepayers hundreds of millions of dollars, but promotes limited local economic development. You all, always hear uh, groups promoting renewable energy as good for local economic development. That can be the case in a correctly designed program, but that is not the case under most RPSs. So how is this possible? Why is this happening? I think Mitch explained the expansive definitions of renewable energy. Maryland has one of the most expansive. We see in Maryland a lot of black liquor, a lot of biomass, and a lot of municipal solid waste, which is incineration. And we see a law, law that is very permissive on the use of these unbundled wrecks as Mitch described them. I have a brief graph in here, a brief chart of unbundled wrecks. I'll go through this very quickly. Perhaps it can help you visualize a bit more what this is. But as Mitch mentions, utilities can buy energy and recs together to prove to their state government they have bought a certain amount of renewable energy. But in many states, they don't have to or they may not want to. And a utility can choose just to purchase energy. So in North Dakota, we see that uh, they have a lot of wind. They have a voluntary RPS, I believe. And so they are selling their wind energy credits to Maryland to be used. Um, so um, the producer of that renewable energy can sell those recs separately, unbundled, and they sell them to brokers, utilities, and individuals. This is a closed market. It's very difficult to have to determine what's happening in the market. Um, but the utilities buy these credits to satisfy their state requirements. I will say in Maryland, um, they are obeying the law, law as written. Um, so as far as we know, the shenanigans are the fact that we have a poorly designed law and we let this law continue to operate as is. So what's the scope of the problem? In Maryland, it's again, it's hard to tell, but we estimate about 80%, and that's a very conservative estimate, of Maryland wrecks are unbundled. And our review of them show that they're usually not new. As I mentioned, they're often not clean and they're usually not local. And so for this presentation, I'll look at three different things, hydropower, 
wind and uh, woody biomass, basically the burning of wood waste. Um, so this is a graph. Hydropower in the United States has been relatively constant for the past 16 years, and it's been affected mostly by weather condition. So Maryland buys a lot of wrecks from water, and, and small hydro in particular. So it buys them from the Northeast, that's the gray line, fairly constant since 2002. It buys them from the Midwest, which is the yellow line, and it buys them from the Southeast. Um, so what does all of this mean? Maryland's buying lots of wrecks from around uh, the, the Eastern part of the country. So looking at the um, slide here, this, these are the wrecks that are purchased from small hydro, and this would appear to be a great success, uh, the amount of renewable energy being used in Maryland is growing up, going up and up. And hydro, small hydro, is recognized by almost every group as a good source of renewable energy. So um, you'll note that they've gone up from over 200,000 around 2008 to 1.4 million. And again, this would appear to be a great success story. However, as we saw in the previous slide. Um, Water uh, hydropower is not really going up in the country. What's happening is Maryland is just buying more and more paper credits and it appears we're using more and more renewable energy when in fact we're not. And in fact, our ratepayers are losing out because utilities are buying wrecks from Pennsylvania, New York, West Virginia, Virginia, and I've circled Maryland. A very small percentage of the wrecks are actually being purchased in state. So this money is going directly out of state to hydro dams and utilities in other states that aren't producing any more energy than they did before. And in fact, many of these dams have been in existence uh, for decades and even centuries. So uh, this is a very uh, complicated uh, uh, chart here. Um, you can go back and look at it in more detail if you want some some facts, but wind. So wind is obviously a very good source of renewable energy. Everyone agrees on that. On the right side, uh, you'll see the number of wrecks purchased uh, by Maryland utilities, the number of wind wrecks and where they came from. So Illinois, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, um, but only 1.3% came from Maryland. So we're not really uh, stimulating uh, regional wind growth or helping the Maryland economy in any way. Uh, and, and some will argue, well, we're, we're stimulating new wind energy. Um, and uh, is that really true? And that raises a number of questions. So if you look at the left-hand side, um, you can see the year the facilities came online, where in 2016 uh, those wrecks were coming from. So 62.5% of all new wind in Maryland came from facilities that came online before 2010. And I think the question that raises is it's really fair to ask why Maryland is subsidizing Midwestern assets of international corporations uh, for their facilities that are already financed and operating. And this becomes more and more of an important issue as wind prices become competitive with uh, coal and, um, and other forms of fossil fuel in the Midwest. These are large international companies with assets all over the world and we have no idea what they do with our money and that energy, most of it is not even ending up on the grid that Maryland uses. How about biomass? So biomass, a lot of states are rushing to put biomass in the RPS and it's pretty hard to figure out why other than politics. Uh, this is a terrible renewable energy and, um, and the money just leaves the state uh, uh, in Maryland. So Maryland, the number of wrecks bought by utilities in Maryland from electricity produced by burning wood waste increased tremendously from 371,000 in 28, uh, 2008 to 537,000 in 2016. So the big beneficiary here was Virginia. Virginia biomass plants uh, residents, we sent $21.2 million over the past eight years to Virginia biomass plants. Just go online and search on the state websites. Uh, the state of Virginia is really promoting biomass energy and they are doing everything they can to help uh, convert existing facilities to biomass and they can sell wrecks to uh, states like Maryland and we can send them our money and get absolutely nothing in return. So the woody biomass results in 50% more CO2 than coal according to some studies 
And although those studies are somewhat contested, it, it definitely is a large CO2 emitter. And the use of woody biomass as an energy source is opposed by all major health groups because of the particulate matter, which is very dangerous, which is emitted from the combustion of wood. This is a very unhealthy fuel source. Um, so it's also costly. So we talk a lot about you know, climate change and we have to respect the fact that there will be costs incurred in uh, changing our energy sources. But when it's going to sources like these, we really have to question it. We have to question when our brethren in this industry and our movement say that it's really promoting local development. So we added up the costs. Who are the beneficiaries of these unbundled wrecks? And you can see Virginia, Illinois, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, New York, all the way down to North Dakota receive large payments uh, from Maryland ratepayers. And again, get certificates in return. Um, and this allows the utilities to claim their uh, energy is greener than it really is. And again, the utilities are doing what the law allows them to do. So uh, the conclusions uh, we have drawn, uh, working closely with Food and Water Watch and others, is the RPS in Maryland and many other states, but we're focusing on Maryland, is flawed because of the use of renewable energy credits. This will not drive 100% clean energy in our future. It may provide incremental change, but will lock in these dirty energy sources and impose really unnecessary costs on Maryland residents. And it often benefits big, dirty businesses and brokers. People want in on this money. So there's a simple answer. Politically, it's difficult, but the answer is very simple. We need to force uh, our states, our utilities, we need to change the laws so that they're required to enter into power purchase agreements for clean energy, like solar, wind, and small hydro. So thank you for the opportunity to give that overview. And I'll see if I can get out of here. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Tim. Perfect. Great. So I think with that, um, thank you so much for sharing all of that, Tim, and giving us a deeper dive into, you know, really what that, that looks like, especially with the context of Maryland. We are going to kick it over to Tyler to share a video um, from our own Frida, who I introduced in the beginning, who is uh, Food and Water Watches and Food and Water Actions campaigner in Europe. And we're going to give this technology a go. Hi, this is Frida from Food and Water Europe, speaking from Brussels to you. And I just wanted to give you a little update about the situation in Europe concerning what uh, the gas lobby calls renewable gases. Um, so there is a lot of talk about renewable gases. Um, there will be legislative proposals coming up soon and uh, on EU level. And all together we realize that it's, uh, it's a topic that uh, uh, we are getting confronted with more and more. So. Um, what do we talk about when, when we talk about uh, renewable gases? Mainly about biogas, then biomethane, synthetic methane, um, and uh, hydrogen. So first, um, there is biogas, <clears throat> which is based on, uh, yeah, which, which has been produced from biomass or waste. Um, and we see that there might be a lot of problems that we also saw with biofuels. Um, where does the biomass come from? Uh, shouldn't we but rather reduce waste and avoid waste and uh, and so on? Um, if biogas is being up, um, purified and upgraded um, so that its methane content is higher, then it's called biomethane and it can be injected into the grid. Um, yeah, so far in Europe we have around 18,000 biogas plants. Um, and uh, of those, we have uh, around 450 that are upgraded to um, biomethane plants. Most of those, the big majority of those is in Germany, but there are also many in the UK, in Switzerland, in Sweden, and in France. And uh, especially the number of biomethane plants has been growing a lot in the last years. Um, and then we have the, yeah, the process called power to gas to produce either hydrogen or a synthetic methane. With hydrogen we see that uh, at the moment we there are only very few uh, pilot projects in Europe, very small ones. One that is always mentioned is the Leeds CityGate project in the UK where a whole city is, uh, town is trying to adapt its gas grid to, uh, to be um, able to transport hydrogen because hydrogen can not be transported or only up to 10% 
um, be transported in the in the natural gas grid that we are having now. So yeah, it seems like it's on a very small scale and very pilot um, level at the moment in Europe. Um, then, um, if yeah, if renewable energy is used to create hydrogen, then it can be called renewable hydrogen. If then there is another step taken further, then uh, CO2 is uh, added to this hydrogen. It has been generated with the help of renewable energy and, um, and this turns the, the hydrogen into synthetic methane. What is interesting is that for uh, the production of fertilizer, sometimes there is another, the, the other way around um, is taken. So taking out the CO2 uh, from natural gas is then producing hydrogen, which then can be used for fertilizer. So it's all these kind of conversions, either from hydrogen to natural gas or from um, for, to synthetic gas or from um, natural gas to hydrogen. Um, this is also quite inefficient and, and very complex process where a lot of energy is, uh, is being lost. Another thing that uh, we want to point out to is that the synthetic methane is nevertheless just methane, so it can it can slip, it can get uh, yeah, it can get into the atmosphere and has a very harming effect. And of course, um, it produces CO two when it's burned. So um, another thing, another caveat that we want to point out to is that um, it's not even sure to which extent renewable gases could feed European gas demand. And there has been a study from uh, the consultancy ECOFIS called um, gas for climate that suggests that only around a quarter of current gas demand in the EU can be supplied with renewable gases in 2050. So what we see in general is that gas lobbyists love the argument of renewable gas, um, however sustainable it really is, um, particularly to justify a build out of gas infrastructure, a continued build out of gas infrastructure as we see it here. In Europe, we have already high overcapacities. We should see and we do see a declining demand. And nevertheless, there are more and more pipelines being built um, with the argument that in the future, these pipelines will, will carry green gas. Um, First of all, the production centers will be different if it's about uh, renewable or green gases. Um, the demand patterns will be different. So, um, yeah, this argument does not seem to, to stand on solid ground. Uh, and also those who produce gas now will not most likely not be those producing hydrogen or biomethane. Um, it's rather an argument to keep on with business as usual to justify more pipelines, more terminals, more um, compressor stations. One argument that is coming up a lot uh, around renewable gases, but also around natural gas, of course, is, um, is energy storage. And um, it's mentioned that in Europe there is there are capacities available to store gas that are a thousand times higher than to store electricity and also less costly. Um, yeah, but nevertheless, um, we, we criticize that the gas lobby is using this faraway solution uh, of renewable gases, which are, first of all, not really sustainable in many cases, not, uh, they didn't prove their feasibility on a larger scale, and um, that would need a lot of development and would, would need to prove that they could actually supply Europe with, uh, with enough energy. So, yeah. We, we want to point out that it's really dangerous to um, see renewable gas as the faraway solution to just keep on business as usual and eventually find out that we need to phase out gas altogether. Thank you. Wonderful. So um, I'm glad that you all got to hear a little bit from our brilliant colleague, Frida, a little bit about you know what it looks like in Europe and, and the work that she's been doing. Um, we are really live tonight with some technical difficulties, again, from Connie in the storm. And so we're going to try to bring on her colleague, Jim at NC Warren as well. And we're gonna see if our technical fi fix works um, from Tyler's screen here. Amazingly, thanks to uh, Jim and the others for uh, working through the technical difficulties. We've got thunderstorms in North Carolina. So um, I'm stepping in to try to uh, give you a little context of what's happening with the uh, North Carolina reps. I did hear the uh, latter part of the previous uh, 
presentation and it sounds like we're in total accord that, that the utilities are really scamming the public in a lot of different ways. In North Carolina, uh, I'm going to run through this pretty quickly. We uh, had a bill, uh, a, a reps bill passed in 2007 to require two and a half, uh, 12 and a half percent renewable in EE by 2021 and, and two tenths of 1% of that was biogas. I should note that that bill was hijacked and traded off by the utilities uh, for efforts to, to try to help pre-finance the building of nuclear power plants. So uh, the bill from the very outset was very controversial and has been since then. And, uh, you know, the, the whole issue of trying to uh, convert swine waste into energy is um, got lots of holes in it. It's been te technological failure for a long time. North Carolina has about as many uh, hogs here kept in captivity as the state does have people. And uh, vast amounts of uh, waste that are stored in, in open cesspools. They, they tend to call them lagoons. Um, and the waste is uh, gradually sprayed onto um, agricultural fields next door and where it drifts all over the communities. Um, and the, they overflow the, um, the cesspools and, and overwork the spray fields so that um, the uh, waste runs off into waterways and runs through a very thin um, uh, layer of, of protection before you hit the uh, very shallow uh, groundwater. They even spray the waste when it's been raining for days. Uh, so we know it's not a sound practice. So anyway, Duke Energy now recently was rolling out a heavy PR'd um, effort to claim that they uh, are gonna, gonna do biogas. They even sort of implied that they had solved the overall hog waste issue, which has been such a tragedy across this state. Um, what they're proposing to do is capture the, the methane from uh, cesspools at five local farms in uh, one county, Duplin County, and then convert it to pipeline quality gas and put it into the uh, natural gas system and then offset it by, or, or claim you, the use of it as an offset by burning it uh, or burning gas at the um, at a Richmond County facility at a power plant a couple of counties over. Anyway, um, Duke University got into bed with Duke Energy and Google and um, several years ago and, and did a test project at a, a farm in another part of the state uh, and where they did uh, succeed in converting um, gas into electricity on that particular site uh, at a very high cost, by the way. And, and that cost is so high that they neither Duke University or Duke Energy are willing to um, try to move forward with that um, type of process on a uh, scalable uh, project. But anyway, they, uh, they're using it to make the public think they've solved the incredible tragedy uh, on, on these thousands of North Carolina communities um, that's posed by all these, these hog farms. And meanwhile, they produce no evidence to indicate that even if they were to be able to, to uh, scale up the biogas, no evidence that it would reduce the um, air and water assaults on the people living near these uh, facilities. We're pretty clear that it, you know, conversion to biogas doesn't eliminate the uh, use of the uh, spray fields where they use industrial sprayers to uh, 
inject the waste into the air into these agricultural fields claiming they call that irrigation by the way um, in fact there are some uh, there's some evidence that uh, the uh, production of biogas actually increases the uh, levels of ammonia emissions there so anyway um, the biogas is not a model for uh, improving hog waste management um, and uh, Meanwhile, Duke Energy is blocking real solutions for uh, especially solar power and, and energy storage. And um, that's something that NC Warren has a, a new statewide plan out called NC Clean Path 2025, which could uh, pretty quickly replace uh, coal and natural gas with local solar, on-site solar, coupled with uh, storage and energy uh, balancing programs. And uh, so it looks like Duke Energy and Duke University are set to do the bare minimum of biogas and then try to make people think they've, they've done something good. And then, then use that to continue building uh, fracked gas power plants by making the public think they're actually using a lot of biogas from swine waste. So I will stop there and um, hopefully that's a little bit of an overview of what, uh, what's going on in this uh, state. Yeah, thank you so much for hopping on, Jim, and for being able to give us that perspective. I think it also, it's very clear the connection between you know the corporate control of our food and our energy systems and kind of, yeah. you know, we talk about that all the time. Um, so thank, thank you for that. and. Um, hope that you're all safe in the storm as well. With that, I am going to move on to some questions and answers, but first, um, I'll just mention that you can help work on some of these things with us. Um, you can help move our country on the National Off Act, Off Fossil Fuels Act, actually. So you can ask your representative to co-sponsor the Off Act, and you can do that by going to offfossilfuels.org, navigate to the Off Act section of the website and you'll also find other ways to volunteer there. Um, we will also follow up with everyone after the call and share that, share the sign up page, share the toolkit, some instructions for recruiting your friends and, and other people in your area to have a meeting with your representative on this and some other things as well. You can use it. Uh, the toolkit will have everything you need like a section by section guide of the OFF Act and a humongous organizational sign on letter that's really cool to take a look at as well. You can download it, print it, and, and you know, run with it. So with that, people have really been submitting questions through the Q&A, but also submitted some ahead of time too. So we have all of those. We've been answering the questions in the Q&A. You can keep asking them there. Um, but I'm actually going to start with Tim um, and ask you a question that has been sent in. I think it's a really good one. Um, the question for you, Tim, is how can the public work to strengthen these, how can the public work to strengthen these standards and what are some obstacles that they can expect if they're working on LPS? Well, it's, it's really a state by state issue. So it depends what state you're in, but um, you certainly will hit a lot of resistance because people are making money off of this and it's free and easy money. So um, I'd look at your state uh, and uh, if you're involved with Food and Water Watch, try and build a coalition um, of people and focus on the money. Um, uh, the wrecks uh, are very hard to explain. People get uh, cross-eyed. Um, but I think when you start talking about ratepayer money being wasted, um, that resonates very well. Uh, the um, other thing that's resonated well in Maryland is um, we, we tried for years to get rid of the dirty sources, but I think what's resonating a little bit better, and this is uh, hats off to Food and Water Watch again, is talking about the, uh, the unbundled wrecks and finding a simple way to say, you know, we're subsidizing these um, these energy, uh, dirty energy sources out of state, and we're not even getting energy in return. Um, that resonates very well also. Great, thank you. Got another one for Mitch. Uh, how can one calculate if a biomass energy system is truly renewable or zero carbon? 
Uh, well, the simple answer is they're not zero carbon. Um, the, the idea that biomass is zero carbon is something being pushed by the industries that benefit from um, being able to burn those products, whether it's the forestry industry, or if you're gonna broaden the idea of, of biomass to include um, uh, agricultural waste or animal manure. Um, you know, we just saw recently uh, Scott Pruitt um, decide to announce that biomass is carbon neutral. This is a position that has been pushed by um, the Republicans in Congress as well, and some of the some of the Democrats too. I mean, let's be fair. Uh, and so, you know, the fact of the matter is, biomass is not carbon neutral. It doesn't. If you could, if you could grow a tree in a day, maybe, <laughs> but we don't, we can't, and we don't want to geoengineer them. So the fact of the matter is, biomass is not carbon neutral. It is not something that's actually benefiting our fight against climate change, no matter what anybody tells you. And we need to reform the way that we approach these various industries, whether it's the paper industry or animal agriculture. These things need massive reform. It's a huge fight in and of itself. It's not the, the topic of tonight's webinar, obviously, but um, especially on the, on the agriculture side, something that Food and Water Watch has been involved in since our inception 12 years ago. We fight across the country. There's gonna be an exciting announcement next week, which I can't leak, but pay attention, sign up for our, our emails. Um, and so, you know, it's it's, at the end of the day, there's only a few sources that are really going to get us where we need to go. And the, the main two are wind, both onshore and offshore, and solar, both distributed and utility scale. And that's where we, as a movement, need to be focused to decarbonize electricity, then move transportation to electrification, and then focus on the really, really hard problems, including decarbonizing Art, uh, agriculture, but also a variety of industrial processes. Great. Um, there is also another kind of, I think people have been really interested in a lot of the, the things that have been in politics recently, but, uh, but specifically financial institutions. And so it's a really good question for either of you who would like to answer it. Uh, how do we institute public control of clean energy development when we don't yet control the financial and energy institutions? It's a big one. You can both take it. <laughs> uh, Tim? Um, uh, how do we do it all? <laughs> look, yes, we have, you know, and, and this is one of the things I love about working at Food and Water Watch is that we actually don't only work on environmental issues. We work on a variety of issues. I'm actually on the steering committee of the, the Robin Hood tax. Um, or a coalition which is looking to put a financial transaction transaction tax on Wall Street. We work on trade. We were um, one of the leading green groups fighting against fast track and the TPP. These things are all tied together, right? We can't we can't extricate them and 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 put one to the side. And you know, Tim works on a variety of issues as well. And I don't want to you know, they all have to work together. If we're gonna fight climate change, we have to fight income equality. We have to fight the power of finance. We have to fight the offshoring of jobs that where they can go where one, people don't make any money, and two, there are no environmental regulations. These things are all tied together and, and we at Food and Water Watch, and, and I believe also, um, if I can speak to you for you for a second, Tim, folks at Chesapeake uh, PSR, uh, you know, they are, after all, physicians for social responsibility. We have a broader agenda that goes beyond just what we're talking about tonight. And these things, we see these things as linked, and we're working on all of these issues. But at, at the end of the day, the key is the same, which is we have to build the political will to win these fights. I can remember years ago when I first said, to a member of the state legislature in Maryland, let's ban fracking. Luckily that member said, okay, let's do it. But hardly anybody else did. We were laughed at, we were ridiculed. People said we couldn't do it. But we organized, we talked to voters, we got more organizations. 
Tim played a vital, vital role in this fight. And eventually we got the community, not only the green community, but we got some labor, we got faith organizations, we got a host of organizations across the state, churches and businesses to say, let's do this. And we were still being told weeks before we won that it would never happen and we won. The key is organizing. The key is building the political will and the political power to enforce that will. So what you have to do, I've noticed Caitlin over here in the chat has talked about talking to her members to get them on the OFF Act. What you have to do is talk to your members of Congress, your state senators, your state legislators, your city councilmen and your mayors and make them, don't ask them, make them do the right thing. And if we do that, we can fix these problems. We can make big money. We know we can, but it takes all of us working together. Sorry, I went on a rant, Rebecca. No, it's okay. I think it's a, a really good testament to what we're talking about when we're talking about organizing. Um, we're starting with the ask and, and building the power we need to get it done. And sometimes it takes a really long time, but I think that that was great. Tim, do you want to speak to kind of what at Chesapeake P PSR you guys have added to this? And, and Mitch, you know, spoke to it a little bit, but I'd like to give you a chance to respond as well. Yes. Yeah, so just to I've, I'm fairly new to the environmental movement, and I started out um, wanting to do a lot of education. And that's really important, but without the organizing and the activism, nothing will happen. So the story I use is when the Tea Party wanted to take congressional seats in Virginia, uh, they didn't hold workshops in Arlington, the most liberal part of the state. Uh, to convince Arlington they were right, they organized in specific districts and took power. And that's what the environmental movement's going to have to do. And it, it's a nonpartisan issue. The Republicans are worse on the issue, but, you know, it's a regional issue. There's no, there's no, you know, no one's going to come save us. I think that's a perfect way to close us out. Uh, thank you for speaking to that. And again, we'd love everyone to get involved with all of these things that we're talking about, get involved with working on the OFF Act and the things that the panelists have talked about as well. Um, we can plug you into our central volunteer teams as well, who do a lot of great work um, wherever they are on the campaigns that really need um, an extra push at that moment. So it's been a really, a really wonderful uh, teams to get involved with as well. We would love to thank our allies uh, and partners who have shared this webinar with their networks and been here with us tonight, as well as our speakers, especially our friends at NC Warren, for all of their technical um, jumping through hoops to, to be with us. We really, really appreciate it and them being able to share their perspective and what they're working on. So shout outs also to the Progressive Democrats of America, People Demanding Action, of course, NC Warren and the Chesapeake Positions for Social Responsibility. Uh, and of course, thank you to all of you for spending your evening with us. Thank you for bearing with us. And thank you for getting involved in doing this work. We obviously could not do it without you. And so that's it for tonight. And thank you all for joining and have a great evening. <laughs>